If you have a Bible, you're going to turn to John chapter 14 and just keep it there. Because uh, as Chad said, things are going to be a little bit different this morning. You're going to hear from different people. And so we're going to be uh, all just kind of walking through this chapter. Um, and if you saw your bulletin this morning, you saw that we're talking about gifts. Now, I don't know about you, but you may be a person that's easy to buy for, easy to buy gifts for. Um, for me, I- I'm pretty easy. I-, I like cash. And if you're ever going to buy me a gift, just cash will be great. You know, my wife says, well, that's not very thoughtful. I said, well, if you give me cash, I can buy something very thoughtful for myself. It will be great. But so we're, we're talking about gifts. And so I don't know if you're easy to buy for or what. I don't know what type of gifts you like. I don't know what's going on in your world. But here's what I do know. There are a lot of things. I, I'll say this. Uh, there's a lot of things that I don't know. But here's what I do know. That in this room today, there are different people who are going through different things. But whatever is going on in your life, whether life is good or, or life is hard, life is bad, it's overwhelming, it's unbearable, or maybe life is great. Here's the thing that I know. The reality is, is that we all need Jesus. We all need this gift of salvation. And I want to read real quickly John chapter 14, verses 3 through 6. It says this, and Jesus is talking. He says, If I go away and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself so that where I am, you may be also. You know the way to where I am going. Lord, Thomas said, We don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And here's the deal. Almost all religions in the world are trying to figure out how to get to heaven, whether it's through being good, giving money, going to the to the house of worship, to the place where they do worship, doing nice things, keeping certain rules. All religions are trying to figure out how do we get to heaven or whatever they believe is heaven. And, and you know why we're all all these religions are trying to figure this out? Because everyone is hoping is hoping for something more than just what we have here on earth. They're hoping for more, and and they're also hoping to get there. And it makes total sense when you understand that as, as individuals created by God, we were created for eternity. We're looking for more because we were created for more. And in that, Jesus speaks to you and to me, and he says that I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He's saying to us that in me, there is hope. In me, there is more. There's more. And I know what people say, that that just sounds, that's just too exclusive. That's, that's so arrogant. How can Jesus say that he is the only way? That's narrow-minded. But, but here's the truth, and you see this truth in verse 3. Jesus is the only one that's coming back for you and me. Erwin McManus, he's a pastor at Mosaic Church in California, and I love the way that he said it. He said, Jesus isn't giving you the bad news from his perspective. He's giving you the bad news of reality. And he's saying, no one else is coming for you. There is no other God that that loved you and pursues a relationship with you. There is no other God that does that. There is is no other God that, that went to the cross for you. There is no other God that loves you so much that they were willing to step out of heaven Come to a broken world and make a way for you and me to be with Him in heaven. Jesus' claim is exclusive, and I will agree, but it's not exclusive, exclusive in who can go. Because everyone can go. Everyone is invited. It's exclusive in how you get there. Jesus alone brings people to God. Acts 4.12 says, There is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to people by which we must be saved. In John 14 there, Jesus is he's with his disciples for the final time before he's arrested. And he goes to the cross. And he's about to give his life as a ransom for the world to pay for our sins. And his closest followers, his disciples, uh, whom he loved and they loved him, they're about to watch it all happen. Sure, they're going to scatter, but they're not going to go far. They're going to watch. And they're going to watch him literally die. They'll see him nailed to the cross. Then they're going to see him put in a tomb. But before they see that, Jesus wants to remind them that he is life. Life may get tough. Life may get ugly. But don't forget that I am life and I am coming back for you. And I want you to know this morning, 
And I know we're, kind of, we're just jumping into this full force, and that's great. I'm excited. But whatever circumstances you're facing in this world, Jesus is life. And you can have hope because Jesus is the way to the Father, and He's going to show us the way. He's not only showing us, but He is the way. And you know His words are truth because He is the only God who died and then rose again. And this is what salvation means for me and for you. He's coming back. And he's the only one, the only one coming back for you. Thank God that he loved us so much that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. You know, we're talking about gifts today. And, and as Jimmy said, one of the greatest gifts we had was the Savior, Jesus Christ, and what he did for our lives. And in this, in this passage in John 14, we see that the disciples, this is the last time that the disciples are going to see him before he begins the passage to the cross to pay for our sins. And he's talking to the disciples and they begin to ask him questions. And one of the questions I love is, is in uh, verse 8 of 14. And this is what Philip asks. He says, Lord, said Philip, show us the Father. And that's enough for us. I love that question because when you begin to dig into that, he says, Lord, just show us the Father. That's enough for us. What he's saying to Jesus is pretty much, God, just give us the knowledge of God, and that is plenty. That's all we need. That's all we need. And, and Jesus then begins to go, have I not been with you? Have I not been with you and have I not shown you what we're about, what the kingdom of God's about? And I love this because when you see in a scripture, it says, truly, truly, you know Jesus is serious. And in verse 12, he goes, truly, truly, I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do. You see, when, they, when Philip asked the question, well, we just want to know the Father. Okay, you're getting ready to leave, and we want to know what you've been talking about. He's like, no, truly, truly, here's what we're going to do. Here's what you're going to do. I don't want you to sell yourself short with just the knowledge of God, because for centuries, that is what our people have been doing. That's what the Jews have been doing is the knowledge of God. And they have a bunch of knowledge, but they don't know the Father. And this is what Jesus says. Truly, truly, I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do. And he will do even greater works than these because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, I will do it so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. And I love this passage. But it gets so mishandled, this passage, in so many ways, because the first thing we see is it says, and he will do even greater works than these. And so we think, oh, I'm going to do greater works than Jesus. I'm going to perform miracles. But what Jesus is saying in this moment is he is about to send something that we're going to talk about is another greater gift. And through that gift, we're going to have the church. It's not a magnitude gift. It's a multitude gift of prayer. He says, no, I am going to use a multitude. I am going to be able to do things greater than anything through you as the church. As you seek me, as you pray to me, I am going to do these things because today, if you think about it, millions of churches are meeting and doing far greater than what Jesus could do in one place at one time. And he says, I'm going to give you this gift. And he says, because I'm going to the Father, whatever you ask in my name, I will do it so the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. And so many times I always use this prayer, and I thought this prayer was a time that it was like kind of that magic genie that if I said, all right, Jesus, can you give me this? Then Jesus would give it to me. In Jesus' name, give me this. And it's like this powerful like saying that if you say it it's going to be equipping you and it's going to give you the magical gift I remember when I was 16 I was like all right Jesus give me this nice truck I want a truck I want a truck he never gave me that truck I was disappointed in Jesus because I thought that's what it was was that I go to Jesus and I ask all these things it's very hard in America for us to understand that this is not what Jesus is talking about see what Jesus is talking about is exactly what Jimmy had just said that he's going to the father See, when he says, ask in my name, he's not saying ask in my name as if it's some magic formula. What he's saying is, you're going to go to the throne room, and the only way, way you're going to be able to go to the throne room is in my name. You're going to ask in my name because you're going to be an ambassador. In 2 Corinthians, it says we are an ambassador because of what Christ has done in our lives, because the sin that was paid on the cross, and we are righteous now, and because of Christ, we can go to God through prayer. That is the gift that Jesus gave us on the cross, is he gave us an opportunity to have that conversation with God. He gave us the opportunity to be in the throne room with God, to pour out our lives, to pour out our hearts, to pour out all things, and to allow him to pour into us. 
See, prayer isn't about us just giving him a long list of things and saying, in Jesus' name, answer these. It's for us to understand who Jesus is and that the only way that we can even reach God is not through our sinful selves, but through what Christ has done on the cross. And Jesus is saying this. He says, I'm going to do far greater things for you, but it's going to be through me. And when you come to know me as a Savior, as Lord, you will be able to pray in my name and have access to the throne room of God to pray these prayers. As the church, as a multitude, that we will be doing far greater things than Jesus could ever do because we come and we are the church praying to the Father because of what he did. The gift of prayer is very powerful. The gift of prayer is something that we take advantage of that we, we, we don't fully know it. It's like this gift that we don't really know and we try it and then it doesn't work and so we back it and put it on the shelf. But prayer is one of the most powerful gifts that God has given us to go to the throne room of God and to petition names and things that are going on and to allow him to center us in who we are created to be. And I love this last part because Philip asks, show us the father and that's enough for us. Show us the knowledge we don't want. He goes, no, no, I have something far greater for you. I want you to live a life that is far greater than what I am showing you. And you're going to live it in community and you're going to seek me and pray and you're going to be able to talk to the Father yourself. And he says in verse 15, if you love me, you will keep my commands. If you love me, you'll keep my commands, which means that prayer is also us actively listening to God through the scripture. That we are listening to what God says because we don't know his commands unless we get in his word and understand what he said. And notice it says commands. It doesn't say rules. Commands mean go. Commands mean that we're actively going in it. It's not a list of rules. It's a list for us to go in. And he says, if you love me, it's not about works. The love comes before the works. If you love me, then you will follow those commands. And that is what prayer does for us as it centers us in that. One of the things I want to encourage you is is begin to pray as if you're before God in the throne room. Because when you think of it that way, You think you're in front of the king, the one that can answer, the king of the universe. Your prayers change. My prayer changes. I'm no longer asking God to fix my car. I'm asking for the humanly impossible. The things that humanly impossible can, because this is the creator of the universe. My car can be fixed by a mechanic. But what God can fix is people's lives that are shattered. He can fix broken hearts. If you love me, You will keep my commands. This is what God has called us to do. And I challenge you with that. And he's going to give us something even greater that Roger's going to talk about. Hope you have your Bible still open. And let's take a look at verses 16 and 17. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees Him nor knows Him. You know Him before because He dwells with you and will be in you. Last week during Jimmy's sermon, he told us that God equips us to do what He asks. God equips us to do what He asks. That's exactly what Jesus is doing by giving us the gift of the Holy Spirit. Some say that the gift of the Holy Spirit is the gift of gifts. It's the ultimate gift that we have in the Christian life. When we have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, when we ask Him to be in control of us, He sends another helper. Your Bible may translate that word helper as comforter, counselor, advocate. And He lives with us, and He lives in us. Power, what an incredible concept. Now, for everyone who thinks that you don't have what it takes to live a life pleasing to Jesus and live that kind of life, let me just put your mind at ease. You don't. You don't, I don't, none of us do. But cheer up, because the Holy Spirit has buckets 
of what it takes to live a life pleasing to God. I love the promise that when the Holy Spirit has control of our lives, you will receive power. Not you may receive power, you might receive power. Okay, there's a chance you might receive power. You will receive power. And it's the Holy Spirit that brings the power that each one of us needs to conquer bad habits. The power we need to start good habits. The power that we need to follow Jesus. The power that we need to tell others about Jesus and to be His witness wherever we go in whatever we're doing in life. He doesn't expect you to do it alone. Matter of fact, He doesn't want you to do it. The Holy Spirit wants to help you do whatever it is that God wants you to do and the type of person that God needs you to be to reach others and to be His witness throughout the world. It's the Holy Spirit that fills us with wisdom and helps us live a life worthy of Jesus. It's not us doing it on our own. It's the Holy Spirit that helps us bear fruit in this world for the kingdom of God. The Holy Spirit gives us great endurance. He gives us patience to live the joyful life and enables us to be thankful that all that God has for us and that all that God is going to be doing through us because He lives with us and He lives in us to give us the power to be the, His witness to the ends of the earth. What an incredible gift we have in the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Roger. Um, if you are still in uh, John chapter 14, by the time we get to this point in uh, John chapter 14, we are just a couple hours away from Jesus being carted off by the temple police and by this time tomorrow, Jesus' body will be dead in a tomb. And so, like a loving father, he's not a calculating leader. He anticipates the swing of emotions that will come because of what's going to happen. And um, we see in these next few verses, Jesus doing things that I think a loving father would want to do. He's trying to encourage them, comfort them, um, and ultimately to assure them. So let's just jump into verse 18, and let's just read uh, till verse 20, and then I'll make a few observations. He says in verse 18, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world will see me no more. But you will see me because I live. You will also live. In that day, you will know that I am the, in the Father, and you in me, and I in you. I've never been an orphan. I can't imagine what they were going to experience in the next 24 hours. They had dropped everything to follow this guy, dropped jobs, families, and now they're watching him get beaten and butchered and killed. And he, he's looking at me going, I'm not going to leave you guys like that. And in fact, he says, I'm going to come back to you, which is obviously an assurance of the resurrection. But notice something I think is really interesting. He says, the world's going to see me no more, but you will. You see, the privilege of seeing the resurrected Christ was not just for anybody. It was for those who placed trust and belief in Jesus before the cross, because two very important promises were attached to seeing the resurrected Christ. The first promise here in verse 19 which I, I, I like, he says, you'll live. That's got to mean a lot of things. But ultimately, it says, you're going to be resurrected just like me. And then the second promise in verse 20, which is, is a massive New Testament truth. In that day, it's like, when you see me, this is going to be like this, bam, you will know that I am in the Father, and you are in me, and I are in, and I in you. It's almost a tongue twister. I can remember reading that as a kid years ago and going, uh, but this is a massive New Testament truth that to a Jew would have been blasphemous to say that the creator of the universe would somehow indwell me. But what a massive truth that I have union or assurance. I have union with the creator 
of the universe. That is a sermon in and of itself. I can't imagine their expression when they heard him say that, like, what? But it's a truth that you can hang on to. And then in verses 21 through 25, Jesus does what I think is the natural progression of this whole conversation. He answers the question, who really belongs to me and the Father? And Chris has kind of alluded to this already three times in five verses. And actually, he says it before this and after this. He says this. You think he's trying to say something? If he says something one time, I get it. Two times, I get it. Three times, me might want to listen to it. If you keep or obey my words or commands, that's who loves me. And that is who the Father will love. It's just that simple. The cardinal mark of a believer or assurance of a believer is simple obedience. What a profound assurance. Um, uh, You hear and you obey. You don't hear and then audit truth. It's it's rapid obedience. You hear something, you go, I'm going to think about that. No, you, you obey. It's just a simple assurance of obedience. I believe, honestly, that five minutes of simple obedience, childlike obedience, is better than years of accumulating knowledge and memorizing stuff about our Lord. He wants obedience. In fact, he says in verse 21 that if you obey me, the Father will love you, and I'll reveal more of myself to you. So the the pathway to knowledge about our Lord is simple obedience. And then he ends with this assurance. And Rogers picked up on it. He expands upon the role of the Holy Spirit. He says, but the helper, I love that title, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring remembrance, bring to your remembrance all that I've said to you. On a personal note, for a kid who was labeled with every learning dysfunction under the sun growing up in the early 80s, to know that the Lord was going to send somebody to teach me and to bring back remembrance to things, as long as you're good to put it in. I tell you what, for a guy like me, that's a wonderful assurance. And he did that. We obviously have the New Testament. It's a great song. Uh, it's one of my, my very favorite songs. And many of you know the story behind it. Horatio Spafford lost a son uh, early in life. It was devastating to him. He lost his profitable business in the Great Chicago Fire, wiped him out. Uh, No recovery uh, business-wise from that experience to try to recover from just the depression, the discouragement of uh, of so so much loss and so much devastation uh, being being pushed against his his family. Uh, He he decided we need to get away. They were going to travel, go over to England, and uh, he couldn't go, tying up loose ends to business things, sent his wife and daughters on ahead. We're in the middle of the Atlantic in a shipping lane. Uh, there, there was a collision of two ships. and The one that his wife and daughters were on went down quickly. His daughters all drowned. His wife was rescued, went on to England, and uh, cabled back, saved alone. Horatio Spafford then got on a boat. His wife on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean to try to get to her in the grief that he experienced. And he'd asked the ship's captain, when I get to that spot, shipping lanes were familiar, when I get to the spot where the ship went down, would you let me know? And so when he got to the spot, a grief-stricken father, broken in so many ways, he, he started talking to his Lord. He was a committed believer. And he said, When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. It's, this passage is so incredible. When you lead into it, 
Jesus has knocked all the props out from under his disciples in chapter 13. He's told them all kinds of things that have their heads just spinning. That They don't know what's going to happen next. Jesus has told them repeatedly, over and over and over again, leading up to this book. I'm going to be arrested. I'm going to be beaten, tried, and I'm going to die. But on the third day, I'm going to rise from the dead. And they just never did hear that rise from the dead part. And they couldn't possibly understand or get, wrap their heads around all the things that were going to lead up to that. And, and then, you know, we finish chapter 13 in John's gospel with, oh, yeah, and uh, Peter, you're going to, betray, you're, you're going to deny me. He's, they've, you've already told him one of them's going to betray him. Uh, there's so much confusion. That's why I love, I love the first verse in chapter 14. Let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. And then he starts unwrapping gifts. One after another, after another, after another. And today we've been celebrating the gifts of chapter 14. And it's such an amazing journey to take. This amazing, wonderful, one of the sweetest things in the Bible that just the hours just before the cross... With the shadow of the cross hanging over every word that's going to happen in chapter 14, 15, 16, 17. The cross is prominent. Just it's only a matter of time. And Jesus, in that context, here's his concern. He's concerned for the peace, for the joy, and for the faith of his followers. I don't know what you'd be doing if you knew that you were about to die a horrible, violent death. But most of us, we'd be worried about how can I strengthen my resolve? How can I survive? How can I run? How can I hide? How can I abandon to find my own peace, my own joy, my own faith? But Jesus' heart in the midst of the journey to the cross is to reinforce the peace the joy and the faith of his followers. Thinking always of others. Thinking always of their needs. Peace, joy, faith. And these are the gifts, his burden for his followers as he anticipated his suffering. And remember, his suffering is not the pain of nails in his hands, nails in his feet, ultimately going to be a spear in his side, the beatings, the crown of thorns, the, because the burden of the cross is the price paid for sin. That the sinless Son of God is going to take on the sins of the whole world for all time upon Himself because it's a sacrifice that has to be made to pay for the sins of the world. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins, but it had to be someone who is sinless to do it. Jesus pays the price. Because of the distance from there to the cross was sufficient distance to pay for the sins. Jesus has all this on his mind, on his heart. And in verse 27 of John 14, peace I leave you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. It's amazing how Jesus in chapter 14, he he bookends that thought. Let not your heart be troubled. Verse 28. The last part of verse 28. After he's talked about peace, then he talks about joy. If you love me, you would have rejoiced. Because I'm going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. Joy. Then, verse 29, faith. Now, I have told you before it takes place. So that when it takes place, you may believe. We've said this before in John's gospel, almost a hundred times that word believe shows up. That you might have faith, an unwavering, unbending faith. And this is what he's aiming at just before he suffers. He wants him to have peace, abiding peace. He wants them to be deeply joyful in everything that's about to happen. He wants them to believe what, they, what he has said and what he has done. To have this unshakable faith. Then he says, I want you to have the, I want you to have the kind of peace I give, not as the world gives. Not peace based on, well, everything's peaceful around me. I'm 
I'm, sit, I'm sitting in a lovely nature scene with my cup of coffee with the gentle breeze blowing and birds chirping off in the distance. Oh, now I have peace. He wants you to have peace in the middle of 75 when it's just bad. He wants you to have peace when you experience the great losses of life. Peace no matter what's happening around you. He says, I, I want you to have joy, but not joy just because... Everything's rolling the way I want it to roll and everything is happening the way I want it to happen. So I'm joyful because it came just the way I ordered it. But joy that's bigger than circumstances, broader than our hurts, sustaining joy. Not the kind of joy the world gives. And I want you to have faith, he says. Not the kind of faith the world has where it says, I have faith. Tell me about your faith. Tell, tell me about your, what, what do you really believe? Because when it's hard, when things start to crumble, and, and when what we've pictured as the journey, it doesn't work out that way. When, when it's heavy and hard and broken, do you still believe? And do you have an unshakable, unshakable faith? And these incredible gifts that we've talked about this morning, the outcome of this night is where the source of it all comes. It's the gospel. It always comes back to the gospel. Jesus, the sinless son of God, came to this earth, lived a sinless life, died on a cross to pay for our sins, was raised from the dead to demonstrate the power of the cross and the truth of his life and word that we might have forgiveness of sin, a relationship to God, an eternal life in heaven if we will surrender to him. The gospel. And the gospel is what unpacks all the gifts in John 14. The peace he has in mind. Sometimes people say, well, I know this is, uh, is we're going to have that peace one of these days, one of these days in the sweet by and by, one of these days. Well, in heaven, the new heaven, the new earth, oh man, then it'll all be good. And then I'll have peace and I'll have joy and I'll have this unwavering faith. But that's not what Jesus is saying. Jesus says, oh, that's all out there, absolutely. I go to prepare a place for you, he said early on in the chapter. Heaven's out there. But he said, I'm not talking about one of these days you're going to have all this stuff. I'm talking about right now, right now. You're going to have... You're going to have this incredible, incredible peace, this unending joy, and this unwavering faith right now, in this life, right now, in your heart, in your mind, in your spirit, your soul. And he says, I'm not just waiting for you to have a great life one of these days, but I want you to have all this right now, right now, in this life. That, that life with God just transforms everything, no matter what's happening around us, in us, to us. And then the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Listen, God has so many amazing gifts for you. And he has purchased them at the cross. And... Why are you waiting to unwrap them? Why are you trying to do this by yourself? Why are you trying to make it up something else than this? He's laid out such an incredible plan, such a life-changing, transformational, encouraging, blessed, eternal life for us right now. And why not do it his way? Why not, why not say, instead of doing religion, I'm going to do a relationship with God. Instead of living in fear, I'm going to live by faith. Instead of always discouraged and beaten down, I'm going to live with a peace and a joy that is going to sustain me no matter what. I'm going to, like Ross said, I'm going to start obeying what God said to do. How about that? I'm just going to do what he said to do. And if we'll do what he said to do, the gifts just start exploding all around us. Welcome to the family of God. Welcome to the life he created you to live. Welcome to the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ.